speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and psalms of the Spirit, and sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. We have more psalms this one that doesn't necessarily go along with the sermon, but maybe it makes us smile a little bit, um, gives us uh, something to relax to. So I heard the story of this young girl. She's a little girl, and she didn't want to be late for Bible class. And so when her parents parked the car, and she was running to class, and she was praying as she was running, please God, don't let me be late, please God, don't let me be late, please God, don't let me be late. And she tripped and fell and got all dirty, and her clothes ripped, and she immediately got up and dusted herself off and got herself ready. She started running again. She said, please God, don't let me be late, and please don't shut me down again. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I love little kids. Sometimes what they say means something. All my <laughs> that, is true. that is true. We had some falls today that we're going to pray about. Um, today I wanted to ask a question. Is there somebody in your life that you feel has either fallen away or has refused to accept Christ in their life? You, you, can, not, you, know, you can raise your hand if you want. You don't have to. Um, I think if we're honest, we all have somebody in our life, somebody who who may have known the truth before, may have never accepted that Jesus is the Lord Savior ever in their life and refused to hear a word of truth. I want to give us a word of hope this morning. Um, and when we talk about coming as we are, we can also, we need to kind of look to the side a little bit and say there's never a wrong time. There's never a time where you had to be there. You know, when we were growing up, if you were in the church, there was like an age where you like, if you weren't baptized yet, people were like, why are you, you, it was just like the system that you went through. You grew up in it, even if you didn't believe or anything yet, you just felt the push to be in the water by like age 12. If you felt that push beforehand, you were weird because nobody gets baptized before 12. <laughs> what sins have you committed at that point? You know, we make all these requirements, it's kind of weird. Uh, what is appropriate, what is not. And then on the outside, Sometimes, we talked about this last week a little bit, as the, or a couple weeks ago, as the bigger brother in the story of the prodigal son, we get frustrated when people come later after kind of messing their lives up and then expect to get the same reward. We do. We won't admit that, but sometimes I think we get frustrated in people, and this is shown by us thinking that the moment that they have accepted Christ, even though they've lived this long life of sin because they didn't know who Jesus was, we expect them to fall in line to figure it all out. I want to tell you this story. And this is how we're going to start. This is a real story, though. Not a funny one. But it is funny. I was sitting in the office. This may have been two years into me, into my ministry, life and ministry in general. I was a youth minister at a church in Roseville. My stepdad was the minister. We shared a bigger office that was separated by a wall full of mold, we found out later. <laughs> That's a different story altogether. <laughs> but one day, he came into the office, walked through the door, and, and said, hey, this is what's going to happen today. I'm going to need your help. We're going to baptize an 89-year-old man. <laughs> and I was like, this is awesome. This 89-year-old man was blind. He was 89 years old. His brother was faithful his, most of his life, and his brother passed away. And at this moment, something inside of him made him realize that he won, he's 89 years old, and if you didn't know already, tomorrow may not be guaranteed. And he started to have this inward struggle of wanting to make a choice in his life to commit to something that was bigger than himself. So we have to process something real quick. 89 years of not knowing Jesus as your Savior. So can we all pull that in? This is a long time to live in a worldly way. If you've ever been to Roseville Church of Christ, there's a baptistry way up high. And it is the steepest staircase you've ever seen to get into some water. As steep as it is up, it's steep to get back down in the water. Not wide enough of a staircase for people to stand side by side. And we have a blind 89-year-old trying to walk up some stairs. So I got, I got the, the back, Dan gets the front, and we're trying to get this guy uh, alive to get in the water. And with every step, uh, out of habit, a 
swear word comes out of this guy's mouth. Because <laughs> it's a struggle. So I need you to know, this guy came in with a walker, an, an assistant, and yet we have Dan in front of this narrow staircase with a guy holding on to his shoulders, and me pushing parts to hope that he stays up. Right? And we're getting him up there, and this is great. There are people who decided to come. This is a Wednesday morning at like 9 o'clock. And some of our members who knew his brother came to support. The, and he had no idea who these people were. And they're singing songs. And he says, oh, I don't mean to interrupt if you guys already have something going on. And we said, what do you, what do you mean? Like, I hear people singing. We're like, they're here for you. Well, who are these people? And why do they care? And we got to explain to him that this is a family that you are coming into. This is a family that is so much bigger than just you accepting Christ. This is a family that wants to help you along your journey as well. And they want to support you and celebrate with you. And, and he broke down a little bit. And with each step, he still had the struggle because he couldn't see, he didn't know which way we was going. We had to communicate, take a little bit bigger of a step. And we eased him into the water and I had to run around on the outside to help. It was just, it was a fun little ordeal. And as he came out of the water, the celebration that he had may not have fit what we're used to. Because he came out of the water and said some words in celebration that maybe we might not have shared. But what is awesome and what I think we need to understand and get is he knew within him that his whole life is now going to change and who he was going to be connected to brought a celebration out of his mouth with only what he knew. And all I can think of for me is better late than never, right? 90 years old, and the guy's not alive anymore. And I know with certainty where his heart was and what he wanted in his life, even if he never got to a spiritual maturity that some of us in here have had, because guess what? 90 years of breaking habits of the world is not something that you do overnight, but you can tell that his heart was immediately changed. Because the callous guy, the only guy that came in a little uh, a curmudgeon in a certain way, uh, came out with a smile and a celebratory heart in him. And I was amazed at what a commitment and acceptance of Christ can do with someone. Now, for us here who want to ask that question, do you have somebody in your mind that you know has made their way uh, different? That they decided you know, Jesus wasn't for them, or they just never want to listen, or maybe they understood it and walked away? I want to give you this piece of hope. Do not give up on these people. Continue to pray because it's never, ever too late to come to yes. Jesus. And this is our hope. And Jesus shows us this very clearly with one particular story. And so first, let's just know, it's never too late to come to Jesus. The story is going to be in Luke chapter 23, 32 through 43. Now, this is the story that you all know. We're going to, we're going to read it. We're going to read through it together. And we all know this because this is the story of Jesus on the cross flanked by two criminals who deserve to be there. Not only is it never too late to come to Jesus and accept him, there's also nothing that you have done that could prevent you or him from wanting you to come to him. Out of all the stories of people who came to Jesus, we can always point that, you know, they had this life, but Jesus must have saw something in them, and he pursues them, and they are changed, right? We talked about the woman at the well, living this not-so-great life. She gets an encounter with Jesus. She leaves different. She goes back to her city, her town, tells them all about what this Jesus guy said. They all come and they change. We have a woman who was dragged out of the bed in adultery late before Jesus. In the act, and Jesus, in this you know, in this uh, connection, says, has anybody sinned here? If you, have, if you haven't, you can throw the first stone. And he looks at the woman and says, why are you still here? Has nobody thrown anything at you? No. Well, I'm not going to either. Now leave and sin no more, right? These are the connections and the, the context in which we usually see Jesus interacting with sinners and then leaving them different people. This is a story that is completely different. This is a story, which we'll read, where a guy comes to Jesus and there is no leave here and sin no more because there is no more for him. So let's check this out. Some people like to use this as baptism is important because of this. I will negate that, but let's let's look at this together. 
It says, two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And then they divided his clothes, clothes by casting lots. First off, Jesus' forgiveness in his last moments here on earth is not just for the ones who are putting him on the cross. Because it actually, is. we all, in this room, out of this building, those who even believe in him, we are responsible for putting him on the cross. I don't want you to, to feel bad about it completely. I want you to feel good about how great God's grace is that his son would be willing to take all of that. And to look at you in the face and say, God, forgive each of these. They don't know what they do. And I even think we are looking side to side here, too, on the other ones that deserve every bit of the cross that they're hung to. Forgive them. They don't fully get this life. So the people stood there watching. And the rulers even sneered at him and said, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. I want us to, to get this full picture. Last week I said we don't share enough about this good news about Jesus. We don't share enough about a Jesus who would come and die for you. A Jesus who would get put in a tomb, and that tomb would be empty for you. We share it on occasion. We usually celebrate it the most on Easter. Every once in a while we'll make a connection at Christmas that a, a son was born in a manger and laid on some wood, and that, that's representative also of the same son who laid on another piece of wood, all for the salvation and saving of us. But I think we minimize this important, and we think people have heard it too much, but there is never enough to hear of a Jesus who would come willingly and take on all of our mess so that we could have a perfection when God looks at us. In our imperfection, he sees us by the perfect blood of Christ. That's amazing. It's so important. So, they laughed at him. They mocked him. They said, if this is the chosen one and saved all these other people, why can't he save himself? The soldiers came up and they mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a a written notice above him that read, This is the King of the Jews. We're starting to see how people viewed what Jesus was. They were trying to find ways for either to disprove who he was, or for this to be the crowning moment that this Jesus who is on the cross, if he really is the Son of God, he will do some amazing things to make us all understand who he is. But inside of them, they were hoping that that wouldn't be the case, because we already hear that the leader of these The Jews, the Sanhedrin, thought if we take out their leader, just like we did every other faith-based prophecy, if it's not of God, once we take out the leader, it'll go away. But if it is of God, then hey, we're going to have to sit with this. We're about to find out some things here. If we look at this moment, and you can think about yourselves, or that person that you're talking about, who's living this life, and they're getting towards the end, because we don't know what tomorrow's going to be, and they're sitting at the left and right of Jesus who's about to go. And you're thinking, they need to figure it out because it's almost too late. Jesus' grace and his love is so deep and so wide that it covers all of the things that we struggle with. One of the criminals who hung, who hung in a hurled insult at him. Aren't you the Messiah? This is my favorite part. He's hurling insults, but he also goes, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. If he thought he was really the Messiah, do you think the justice of God would say, yeah, you criminals, murderers, thieves, who deserve every bit of this, I would say that's not what you need to, especially since you're insulting and you don't believe it. And I think this is the struggle, because a lot of times, even like we talked about with the, the prodigal son, he knew the father's plan and truth, but he decided that his plan was better if he left. And it took a dark road for him to turn around and say, oh yeah, my father's truth was right. And God didn't necessarily, the father didn't pursue him, but he waited anxiously for his son to come back. I think in this moment where those who have never really understood 
and heard of Jesus, that Jesus pursues us and gives us opportunities that are presented for us to just say, yes, you are the one. Because just as one is sitting here insulting Jesus on the cross, the other one says this. He rebuked him and said, don't you fear God? Since you're under the same sentence, we are punished justly, but we are getting what we, what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. This is a statement of faith here. This is a the best kind of repentance you can see. So if we do our traditional Church of Christ path to uh, to being saved, what do we say? You have to first. Did we do the five steps? Right? Yeah. And here, the sight's good. Repent and be be baptized. And people confess and be baptized, right? Dear believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. Now we see a lot of these mentions here on this cross from this man. Uh, we don't see one of them, but it's okay. Jesus can do what he wants. And he was not yet dead. And we always say that baptism, that we get through Jesus, come from his resurrection. And if we can go the whole, let's nitpick this down. I'm not going to do that. I want us to see this. This man is sitting on a cross, knowing that he is guilty. And he looks at the other and says, we deserve all of this. But this man doesn't because he's done nothing wrong. And he knows who he is because he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I know that I deserve this death, and I know who you are, and I know what you can do. In my last breath of life, I want to stand up for you, and I want you to know that I am so guilty of the life that I've been living. And only change that can come in my heart is from you. The only salvation that can come for me is through you. The only chance I have to be rightfully before the Father is through you. I, I want to break some things down for us. Um, we as longtime Christians sometimes forget about the grace of God. And we think that our salvation comes from us. And I know we want to admit this. So hear me on this verse. If I go to church enough, if I check enough of my boxes, if I read enough scripture, if I just get my life right, then I know and I can have confidence that I'll go to heaven. If I ask you the question, you definitely don't have to answer this, but maybe you can reflect on it. How many of you are afraid to die? How many of you are worried of what comes next? How many of you worry and ask the weird questions of like, if Jesus came today, would I be saved? I hope that you have confidence through your faith because you know who Jesus is. That you can say, I'm ready when he calls me. But I know in our hearts, and some of us, we have a struggle here. Because we're afraid. And fear is the opposite of faith. And in this moment, knowing that he's going to die, he looks to the Savior. And he knows he's the Savior. Because he says, Jesus, can you remember me when you enter your kingdom? It's never too late to come with all of your baggage to come bearing, this is what he's doing, all of your sin and guilt and grief and give it to Jesus. And he wants to tell you this. I'll tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. This is a promise that wasn't just offered this one time in this moment, but I think it is an incredible statement for the compassion of Jesus. Because could you imagine a lifetime of sin how you've hurt other people, how you've taken advantage of other people. I am sure this is not the first time that these gentlemen were caught doing wrong. And if during the time, if they were the thieves that they talked about, these guys may have been missing some parts of their body too. And it was probably really evident to many people that these were not good standing people because of the physical way that they looked at this time. Also the fact they're hanging on a cross, right? We walk around every day and we try to hide these things from everybody else too. Just as much as there is a hope for us to understand that those who have not known Christ can still find their way to him and it's never too late as long as they have a breath in their body there's a chance for them to know who God is and know who he is through Christ and his grace. 
equally as much as we have breath in our bodies for each day, we have another day to repent. Jesus, forgive me of these sins. Jesus, thank you for the gift of salvation that came through you on the cross and out of the empty tomb. Jesus, help me to be more of your image each day so that others may know who you are by the life that you call me to live. It's a continual repentance moment that when we can look at Jesus and say, remember me when you enter your kingdom. I am deserving of the cross that you have to bear. But you're choosing this for me. This is a story that preaches even if you can feel that you do not have the gift to speak. You all have a gift to witness. And there are some people in your life that need to hear the promise that they may not ever feel that they deserve or will ever receive. And if you're afraid that they might not like you anymore or will not want to be around you or get tired of hearing about this Jesus that you love, can I remember, I remind you of a trustworthy saying that when we die for him, we'll live with him. That when we endure for him, we will reign with him. That when we deny him, he denies us. But when we are unfaithful, he is always faithful because he doesn't deny himself. In the moments where you have opportunity to be Jesus for some people, have confidence. What I just gave you was from Timothy. Paul, given a trustworthy saying to Timothy in chapter 2 of 2 Timothy. You should go and look at that. Earlier in the first chapter, Timothy is known as being timid. He just feels like he doesn't have enough to go out and do things. And he always feels like he's being kind of pushed around and he doesn't know if he is the right person to do the job. And Paul has to encourage him. And he says, God didn't give you a spirit of timidity, but one of power and love and self-control. And he gives us this to use to promote this great and good news of this moment. It's never too late for any of you, for any of those people in your family, for the guys who are out here earlier that are having a really hard life, that are living and in a way that maybe we look at and say, if they just knew who Jesus was, they could change around. I don't know. But the promise is for each of us. But if our first step is to hear before we can get to the last step of being baptized, are we helping those to hear this good news? We believe the good news ourselves that we can't help but to share. This is when we'll start to see those change and come. Reminds me of the day of, of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came to the disciples. And Peter goes out and shares his message. This message about Jesus who took on death and death could keep him. And people were convicted because their hearts were, were softened for the first time. Saying, what do we do with all this information? Repent and be baptized. Wouldn't it be so great for us to see a change in our world, in our families, and in our country, and in our community, and in our neighborhoods, of people who say, what do I do with this great news that I keep hearing from you? Let's pray about that. Let's repent of these, this life that we're living. Let's give it to Jesus, because he wants us to be with him in paradise. You don't need to be trained in the Bible to tell the story. You need to believe it have faith in it, and live in that faith. Because Jesus gives us, through his spirit, power and love and self-control to share this great and awesome news that even the least of these, or even those who just continue to choose against him may have a chance because God does not want any of us to miss out on his goodness. That's why he sent us. Let us have that confident joy in our heart witness to why we love and choose Christ in our hearts. I don't want every uh, sermon to be like, we need to get out and evangelize. I just want you to be genuine with how you feel about the Lord, especially to those in your most intimate circle. And that's why God put us here. And there's people that you will reach that will never be reached by me. Because they know you and trust you and they love you. And hearing from you might be all they need. Know who Jesus is. Let's go down. Dear Father, you're an amazing and awesome God, and your grace is so much more than sufficient. It is overwhelming that when we receive it, not only does it fill our cup, but it overflows that we may fill others as well about who you are, how deep your love is, and how wide your grace is. 
that even in our last moments, if we're living a life that is fully in the world, that you still look and say, there is still room in my kingdom for you. When you believe and accept me as your Savior, you will not perish but have eternal life. I hope that we can get people to the whole fullness where they can believe in you, immerse themselves in the baptism, and be cleansed by your amazing grace, that they may live full lives, that others may know who you are through the rest of their full life of being your servant. But help us, strengthen us, give us courage, and Lord, please open the hearts of those that you put in front of us that they may know who you are. And let your spirit do the work and let us be the best we can. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.